more than just a day to remember something. It's actually the anniversary when something really incredible happened, something so far outside the scope of human understanding that we can't really grasp it. But God himself came down with us, was born as a baby and lived with us and spent his life showing us the ways of the kingdom of God, taught us how to live in the new covenant realities of God and then allowed himself to be accused and tortured and condemned to death and tortured and, and executed as a common criminal, placed in a, in a grave in the ground. And then three days later, he rose from the dead and, and then ascended into the presence of his Father in heaven. Now, I don't know about you, but to me, that sounds pretty impressive. Would you agree? That is impressive. But there's a danger or a risk around that. And the risk is that we can, be, we can think about that and we can just you know, let all the, the amazing implications of that dawn on us and we can merely be impressed and we can become enthusiastic spectators of the life of Jesus and then we can leave it at that and get on with our lives. And I just want to say to you this morning, folks, that God is 100% committed to never letting that happen to you. And I'm 100% committed to it as well. I don't want that to become the case for any one of us here that we get to hear about the things of God and we, and we go, wow, that's awesome, that's amazing. What's for lunch or what's for dinner? I don't want that to ever happen to you. And God is committed to not that never happening to you. Because I'm just saying this this morning, friends, that what I just, that little timeline I just gave you before, that really demands our total attention. That demands that we give it our focus. And we say, God, I'm in. <laughs> I'm in, I'm in. What are we doing? <laughs> I'm in. That's where he wants you to be today. He wants you to be in. Now, you could argue that uh, there are at least two significant days for Jesus' followers. There are more than just today. There's like the day when Jesus died on the cross, when he laid down his life for the sins of the world. And then the, the day, like today, where, when he rose from the grave, proving that he was victorious over death. And you could argue that there's two, there's at least those two significant days. But I want to tell you, there's a difference between the two. And that's what I want to focus on this morning, just for a few moments. I want to share with you that there's a difference between the day that Jesus died on the cross and the day that he rose again. And it's this. When Jesus died on the cross... It's very easy to accept and believe that that actually happened. You don't even need to read the Bible. You don't need to read the New Testament to know that Jesus died on the cross. All you need to do is read history, secular Roman history of the time. And it's full of reports of how this Jewish holy man from Nazareth died outside Jerusalem in about AD 33, was crucified by the Romans History is full of reports of that. So it's very easy to believe that that actually happened. But the second day, the day when Jesus rose from the grave, is different because it's a bold claim of Christianity. It's a claim that we make that the Bible is very, very clear about. Jesus rose from the grave. But it's a claim you've got to ask yourself and bring yourself to the point of saying, am I going to believe this or not? And it's important, friends, because I'll tell you this. If you say, I believe that, it changes everything. Everything changes when you say that. But you might be saying to say, well, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if I can really accept that. That a man could be killed and lie dead for three days, then all of a sudden can come back to life again. Let's talk about that a little bit this morning because it's so, so important. For the first Jesus followers, like Jesus' early, his first disciples, this concept, the fact that Jesus rose from the grave, was so important for them. It, ma it mattered, it was everything. They were about to oversee the launch of the, of the church. They were key players in what God was doing. But unfortunately, their numbers had shrunk just a little bit. They'd lost one of their number called Judas, who had unfortunately committed suicide. And so they had to replace Judas. So, so they said, what are we going to do? Um, it's interesting because they didn't look for someone who would add sort of like complementary skills to their, 
you know, skill set for the team. They weren't looking for someone who had administrative ability or, you know, marketing skills or, you know, they weren't trying to staff their weaknesses like we would do. Uh, they, they weren't even looking for someone with financial backing that could help them in their next campaign. They had one criteria and it was like this. We want someone who was a witness with us of the resurrection. Let's have a look at it in Acts chapter 1. We want someone. Judas must now be replaced. The replacement must come from the company of men or those who stayed together with us from the time Jesus was baptized up until the day of his ascension into heaven. Designated along with us as a witness to his resurrection. That was the key criteria. They had to be someone who'd seen Jesus alive after he rose from the dead. It was so important for the start of the early church. And there's a reason for that, because that would become the rock, the, the foundation in their life, the absolute, the revelation rock upon which the early church was really built, that Jesus is alive. And this is not just a religious idea we're propagating here. We're not just coming up with a, with a new system of belief, a new way of thinking about life, you know, a system of good and evil that you can follow. We're, we're talking about a relationship with a living God right now. That was what they were about to do. I want to read to you from Matthew chapter 16 for a moment, because this is another key revelation of the early church. When Jesus arrived in the villages of that place, he asked his disciples, what are people saying about who the Son of Man, that's himself, is? And they replied, some think he's John the baptizer, some say Elijah, some Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. And he pressed them, what about you? Who do you say that I am? And I love that verse because he didn't say, who do you think I am? He said, who do you say that I am? And there's, you know, there's two things there. is getting a revelation of who Jesus is. But the second part is saying it out loud. Because when you start to say it out loud, Jesus, you know, you are my God. You know, Jesus, you are the Son of God. Something begins to happen in your heart when you start saying and declaring who Jesus is. Next, next slide says, Peter said to Jesus, you are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. I love this. Jesus came back and says, God bless you, Simon, son of Jonah. You didn't, you didn't get the answer out of books or from teachers. My Father in heaven, God himself let you in on this secret of who I really am. And now I'm going to tell you who you are really are. You are Peter, a rock. This is the rock on which I'll put together my church, a church so expansive with energy, not even the gates of hell will be able to keep it out. Now he's not talking about the fact that the church, he wasn't saying, you know, Peter, you're the, you're the foundation stone for the church. He's not saying that. What he's saying is the revelation of the person of Jesus is the foundation on which the church is going to be built. And I want to say to you this morning, friends, that for us, the revelation of Jesus in your heart is the absolute bedrock foundation of your Christian life. And anything the church is ever going to be able to achieve, it's got to be based on who Jesus is. And the fact that he is alive today in our hearts. So that's really what I want to share with you this morning. Um, there's another one, Romans chapter 1 verse 4, uh, which is really important as well. Uh, and this is um, the Apostle Paul writing to um, the church in Rome. And he says, as to his divine nature, Jesus, according to the spirit of, his, of holiness, he was openly designated to be the son of God with power in a triumphant, miraculous way, by being raised from the dead. So what he's saying is that Jesus, everyone knows that Jesus is the Son of God because he was raised from the dead in this way. That's why I've got that highlighted, openly designated. It's a word uh, in the original language that's like our word horizon. It's actually, um, the Greek is horizo, you know, but it, it just means horizon. We get our word horizon. What it means is that God actually pushed the boundaries and extended the limits of our understanding about who God is by raising Jesus from the dead. That's what it's saying. And so, this is, friends, this has got to be a revelation in your heart today. You know, it's all right for someone to stand up here and, and you know, talk about God and talk about Jesus. But I want to say to you this morning, it's got to become revelation in your heart that you know this is real, that Jesus is the Son of God, is real and he's real in your life. That's what really needs to happen uh, in your life. 
if you uh, to be able to move forward into what God has for your life. Now, friends, if you've ever struggled with the idea that Jesus rose from the grave, I want you to just chill out for a little bit, just just relax, because you're in pretty good company. Because a lot of people have struggled with that. Even Jesus' own disciples, they lived with him and walked with him and ate with him for three and a half years. And when he died and rose again, they struggled to get their head around it as well. And here's the thing. He told them repeatedly over and over, at least three times with real clarity. He said, I want you to know this is going to happen. He explicitly told them this will happen. The Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected and be killed and be raised again. He said it to them repeatedly. They still didn't get it. Now, I know that that can happen and it does happen. I've, look, I've been in church all my life, you know. So I, I have heard more sermons than you can imagine. You know, but you go home and, you know, in the afternoon you say, well, what did he talk about today? Well, I'm not really sure. So it doesn't matter what I say to you today. What really matters is what God puts in your heart. And if you can take home one thing today, I want you to take home the fact Jesus is the Son of God and Jesus rose from the dead and He's alive today. He's seated at the right hand of the Father, as the Bible says He is, interceding for us and He is my Savior and my King. That's what I want you to take home today. So the disciples were in a state of turmoil um, Luke, in Luke's gospel, he recorded that after Jesus appeared to them when he'd risen from the grave, they were terrified and frightened. They supposed they'd seen a spirit or a ghost. They didn't know how to handle this. Uh, the apostle John, in his gospel, um, he talked about how they responded to um, when Jesus appeared to them after he rose from the grave. And he, he emphasizes Jesus' words twice, where Jesus, the, his first words were, peace. It's okay. It's okay. I'm, I'm here. I'm okay. Just, just chill out. Be, be at peace, John was saying to them. Obviously, they were freaked out, clearly. Uh, Mark's gospel, he cut straight to the chase. And when the message first came that Jesus is alive, Mark said, he records, they did not believe. They just did not believe. So it's no, don't feel bad about the fact that you've struggled to believe that Jesus rose from the grave. But I know that the Holy Spirit is here today to bring that revelation into your heart that you'll be convinced and you will know Jesus is alive. One of the other disciples of Jesus, Thomas, had decided, he had decided, I will not believe until I see the nail prints in his hands, until I put my hand into his side and just touch and, and know that this actually happened, that Jesus was dead and now he is alive. Here's the thing. You and I today, we've got the benefit of hindsight. And we can look back on 2,000 years of church history. We can see the incredible things that have happened over those years through the lives of people that have been transformed through Jesus. And I want to just, just want to take a few moments to just share with you a couple of things. Because in these... Um, Easter Sunday messages, I, sometimes I'll, I'll try and share with you some of the, let's call them proofs of the resurrection. Now, I don't think God depends on any kind of our human understanding or intellect or our proofs, but sometimes you've got to get it in your head first before it gets down to here. So I'm just going to share a couple of things with you that are relevant to here. Number one, before Jesus rose from the grave, his followers were terrified. They were confused. He'd been the one that they'd been following, who they believed would be the deliverer of Israel, had been accused in a courtroom and sentenced to death and killed on a Roman cross and buried. And they knew that he was dead. So they, what are we going to do? They didn't know. They were terrified and fearful. They were meeting together behind locked doors, the Bible tells us. They didn't know what to do. They had no idea. But then something changed. Because when you read the story in the book of Acts, you read that these disciples were completely transformed. They were fearless. They, they weren't, uh, weren't afraid to speak out exactly uh, what happened. They preached with boldness. They performed miracles. They defied the gr great opposition to take the gospel right around the world. They were completely transformed. What happened? 
Well, I know that you've heard this before, and I, I've often said it too, that what happened was they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Of course, that made a huge difference. But the other thing is they, they met Jesus. They knew that Jesus was alive. They knew Jesus was alive. So that's what really changed them. And, you know, you know as, as uh, I've said before, that um, 10 out of the 12 apostles, followers of Jesus, gave their lives as, a, as martyrs. They sacrificed their lives to support the belief that they had, the conviction they had that Jesus was alive. And all they needed to do was to just to recant, say, oh, sorry, I, I, made, I made a mistake. No one dies to support something they're not sure of or, think, or that might be a lie or might be a delusion. No one's going to no say, well, I'm so convinced of this, I will stand by it until I die. No one's going to do that. But if they know something is true, they might be willing to do that, and they did. The only other two were Judas, who committed suicide, and the Apostle John, who died of old age. But all the others gave up their lives to support the conviction that Jesus was alive. Second thing, there's the, the resurrection accounts varied, and we were talking about this yesterday, Ella. The accounts of the resurrection um, are all a little bit different, you know. And if you read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, they all give an account of what happened. And the little details are different. Now, some people look at that and they say, well, that just proves you that there must proves that that the story is just made up. It's inconsistent. But, you know, that's actually not true because criminal investigators, when they're looking at when they're examining witnesses, um, they're, they're looking, they're, they're listening for the, the, the fine detail of what's being said. If they examine half a dozen witnesses and all the witness accounts are absolutely identical, it tells them one thing. These people have colluded together or they've been coached. So they actually look for differences. And so if there are differences in the story that don't materially affect the outcome or what actually happened, that's a proof of authenticity. And it is. And so if anyone, if you've ever thought, you've looked at the Bible and said, well, there's some inconsistencies here. The Bible, I have to tell you, folks, I, I've spent most of my life, I only learnt this this week, and I'm pretty old, okay? So I've spent most of my life defending the view that there is no contradictions in the Bible. You know, it's actually not true. There are some contradictions, but they're not material. They don't make any difference. It just means that one person saw something from this angle, and the other person reported it because they saw it from the other angle. They saw, they told a slightly different story. It's not that it's not true. They are actually marks of authenticity because they, they reported what they saw. But we don't all see the same things. So let, that's, that's it. So um, marks of authenticity for the resurrection accounts. Okay, what does the resurrection mean for me today? Number one. Because Jesus has risen, because Jesus is alive today, you can live a never-ending life. That is awesome. That's amazing that you can live forever right now. You can be living forever. I, I just love the story in John chapter 11 about Jesus' friend Lazarus. Jesus had friends, not just followers, but friends as well. And that's good. And his friends, Lazarus, passed away. He died. And so Jesus went there and was talking to one of Lazarus' sisters, Martha. And he said this. And Jesus said to Martha, your brother will be raised up. And Martha replied, I know that he will be raised up in the resurrection at the end of time. And Jesus said these incredible words, some of the most powerful words in the Bible. He said, Martha, you don't have to wait till the end because I am. He said right now, oh, Jesus said, I am right now resurrection and life just let that sink into your heart this morning you don't have to wait for the end i am right now jesus said i am right now resurrection and life and the one who believes in me even though he or she dies will live and everyone who lives believing in me does not ultimately die at all it's talking about spiritual life and it is also touching on uh, eternity being raised again in bodily form in, and being in heaven in eternity forever with God. He's touching on all those things. It's, in, it's really incredible. Jesus' victory over death and the powers of evil means that we 
You and I have a rock solid hope for the future. We don't need to be afraid of death. We don't need to be afraid of anything that can happen because God is with you and you know that your future is totally and eternally secure in God. So as Christians, you know, um, you know, we experience sorrow when someone dies. You may be a loved one or, or someone that's close to you has passed away. Most of us in this room would have experienced that in some level or, or other, some way or other. And as, a, as a pastor, I can assure you, I, I have conducted many funerals and uh, I've been here, right here many times and, and, and done that. But, I, but one thing I know for sure, I've seen the difference. Uh, you know, I've, sometimes I've done funerals for people who I knew, I knew didn't have a, a relationship with God. And it's hard going. It's, it's tough. But I've done many funerals for people who love Jesus with all their heart. And I want to tell you, friends, it's a different ball game. And when someone that you know that, that has met the risen Jesus, when they pass away from this life, you know that they know where they're going and there's an assurance that they have eternal that they are in eternity with God forever. And it's a wonderful thing. Second point this morning is because the resurrection of Jesus involved, you know, unimaginable power, you also can have a powerful life today. We don't, we don't need to be just, you know, crouching in a, in a corner, you know, afraid of our, you know, Christian testimony. You can have a powerful life today because Jesus has risen from the grave. And I, I, the book of Ephesians, the, the really the core statement is this, is the Apostle Paul's uh, prayer for the Ephesians. And he's really saying to them, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is in you. It's in you. Let's read it. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18. Paul's praying, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, in order that you may know the hope to which he's called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and that you may know his incomparably great power for us who believe, the same power that was in Jesus when God raised him from the dead. So what he's saying is, friend, as a believer in Jesus, you've got access to the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. That's pretty incredible. That's pre and we don't need to, you know, uh, live our lives, you know, being, the Bible says, you, you are the head, not the tail. You don't need to be, you know, under your circumstances. Some people say, how's it going? Oh, you know, I'm okay you know, given the circumstances. You don't need to be under the circumstances. We've got to be able to rise above those things and uh, give God the glory in our life. I do want to say this, friends, this morning, that you need a revelation from God to be able to exercise that authority and move in that power. It's got to be a revelation in your heart, not just an idea, not just someone preaching a sermon or even reading a book. It's got to be something that God puts in your heart and in your spirit. If you're open to that, he will show you. You know, if Jesus had never risen from the dead, he still had a remarkable life. And, uh, but if his end, if the end of his life was like every other human, having faith, put, you're putting your faith in him, if Jesus died and just stayed in the grave, putting your faith in him would be foolish, really. But if Jesus did rise from the dead, proving that he was the son of God with power and proving that he's alive today, standing in the, in the presence of God, you know, interceding for us, then to not have faith in him would be foolish. It means that his mission and his life would be the most significant, the most powerful thing the world has ever seen. And to not put our trust and hope in him and faith in him would be foolish. So I want to encourage you this morning. I, I want to tell you, as far as I'm concerned, I'm, I'm staking my claim with Jesus. And I'm saying that he is alive today, right now, in the presence of the Father. Speaking for you and I, as the Bible says. Number three, and I'll ask our creative team to come back right now. That God is the God of second and third chances. The fact that Jesus rose again from the dead shows us that when something looks like it's dead, it's not necessarily dead. God is the God of second and third chances. You know, the cross that Jesus died on and the resurrection were no surprise to Jesus. They were all part of God's plan. Nothing surprised God. God and God did exactly what he said he would do. 
He did exactly what he said he would do. You can trust in him to do what he promised to do for you. What he promised to do for you. And if there's a dream in your heart, if there's something that God put in your heart that you know is a God dream, and you can't see how it could ever come to pass, I want you to, this morning, keep putting your trust in him because he is the God of second chances. Maybe you feel today that you've... um, You've taken a wrong path in life and you've lost that opportunity. He's the God of second chances. As a, as a 10-year-old child, um, I gave my life to Jesus. And I, and I clearly remember that I had a, uh, you know, a, a desire and a conviction began to form in my heart in those days that, that somehow I didn't understand how or what it meant. I didn't understand that. But I had this conviction that one day I would serve God in some full-time capacity. Some, somehow or other. And so nothing happened for a long time. And uh, I was about 27 years of age when, uh, and, I, and I was working as a contractor, working long hours as a contractor. We had uh, two, two children. I was married with two kids. And uh, the, that dream seemed a long way away at that time. And then one day, a letter came in the mail. Back in the days when people got letters in the mail. A letter came in the mail and everything changed. Everything turned around and God began to open up doors for us and uh, everything changed in that that time. And so what what I want to say, friends, you you think about your life as a timeline this morning and you might say to me today, if the A to B, A, B, C, D, a timeline of your life, right? A to B might have been a train wreck, might have been a disaster. C to D can be completely different. can be incredible if you just give your life fully into God's hands and you say, God, I'm trusting you to make out of my life what I could never make of it. Can we just close our eyes for a moment? Um, Because I want to ask you the question today, is it time? Is it time to place your life in God's hands and say, God, I, I just stuffed up my life so badly but I'm opening my heart to you right now and I'm asking you to change it. Will you come in? Will you come in on the inside and change it? Friends, it only only works when you open your life up fully to God and say, God, come into my heart. Make me a new person. Make me a different person. Make me the person you want me to be on the inside. Today can be the most significant day in your life if you're willing to do that. If you say, God, come into my heart today, right now. The Bible says that Jesus died upon a Roman cross. And the reason he did was so that he could bear in himself the guilt and the shame and the sin of the world upon himself. And when he died, that was done away with. It was done away with. And maybe you don't have in your heart the knowledge of that eternal life through Jesus, but you can have that today. And I'm asking you, it's while we're gathered here, everyone's head is bowed, no one's even looking around. No one's looking around. If that's you today and you're saying, hey, I'm at that point where I need to, I'm ready to make that decision. I'm saying yes to Jesus right now. That's you. Why don't you just stick up your hand and I'll see it. You can put it down again. Because I want to pray with you and I want to just help you to, to come right into that relationship with God. If that's you today, just raise your hand and say, yeah, that's me. I'm ready to ask Jesus into my life today. Hallelujah. I'm not going to prolong this. In a moment, we'll just continue on with the meeting and bring it to a close. But what's happening in your heart right now? So if, something, if something's saying to you, hey, you need to do this, you need to do this, then, it's, then just take that step. Say, yes, that's me. I'm, hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's begin to sing that song, You're Worthy of It All. You're Worthy. Why don't we stand? Let's all stand up right now.